Good evening, everyone. This is David Jones from Works and Ministries. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there who are celebrating uh, this day. Uh, wish you well, uh, peace and blessings to you and to your family. And I hope everyone has had a glorious week, a blessed week, another exciting week that God has allowed us uh, to come through. Amen. We're blessed today in knowing that Christ is still in our hearts. He's still on the throne in spite of what the world is experiencing today and all of the confusion and the chaos uh, that exists. Uh, those of us who have a relationship with God in Christ, uh, we should have a sense of peace and tranquility uh, in our souls. Uh, if you know the scriptures and you are a, a student of the Bible, um, we're reminded uh, how the Apostle Paul says, and behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we, sh we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye speaks about the catching away or the gathering of the church uh, to Christ, which is soon to return. Uh, so having that confidence and having uh, that assurance, uh, despite of what's taking place in the world today, Amen. We're blessed uh, either way it falls. Uh, it's a lot of things happening that uh, most people today, in fact, even the, the churches today are somewhat perplexed, uh, not understanding uh, what is taking place um, in the world and in the church for that matter. Uh, so there's a bit of confusion there. Uh, but rest assured, we have the victory in spite of it all. Um, we're blessed to be able to see all of this happening, taking place. I never thought uh, the day would come where I would see uh, the church doors uh, close or shut down. But I knew that the earthly church uh, would not last forever. Uh, the church is actually called the Ecclesia in the Bible, and it is the called out one. So God is not so much concerned about a physical building to house the body of Christ. The body of Christ are people uh, who are born again of the Spirit, and they have the eternal uh, kingdom uh, residing within them. For Christ said, the kingdom of God is within you. So uh, we're living in exciting times. We definitely are living in exciting times, and um, people are uh, anticipating uh, something about to happen. And yes, there is something going to happen. Uh, the earth is in a transition period. Um, a change is taking place uh, both in the spirit realm and also in the natural realm uh, because nothing happens in the natural realm until it first uh, happens in the spiritual realm. So as there are wars here that we're uh, contending for and fighting against in this earthly atmosphere, uh, there is a war also uh, in the realms of the spirit. Now, last week, I spoke on uh, doctrine, and I began to explain uh, the importance of doctrine uh, that is needed in the church today, uh, in the body of Christ, because I feel uh, that it is missing. Um, I feel uh, that the church has deviated um, from uh, the actual uh, teaching of Scripture. And it has been misrepresented. The church leaders have uh, replaced it. Somewhere along church history, there was a change um, in leadership. And uh, the church today and the pastors and preachers today are actually teaching and preaching more inspirational, uh, motivational type of speaking, uh, which carry absolutely minimum amount of substance. Um, and I believe today uh, that true doctrine of the scriptures is needed uh, to build up the body of Christ and to strengthen the body of Christ. Because now uh, what you have is a group of believers who are simply living their life off of feeling, off of emotion, um, off of motivation. But they have really no sound doctrine or doctrinal teaching of the Bible. Everything is coming out. Uh, of the old of the New Testament, nobody's exploring the Old Testament um, doctrines of the Scripture. 
uh, messages are strictly New Testament uh, preaching. That's what we have today. So uh, my attempt is uh, to uh, re-educate people, uh, namely uh, those of us who are followers of Christ, uh, back to order of true sound doctrine. Uh, in my experience in life, I've heard many, many preaching uh, messages. And it comes a time, I believe, in everybody's walk with Christ um, that they want to be taught. They're, they're tired of being preached at. They're tired of being yelled at. Um, they're tired of, of the inspirational, uh, motivational uh, preaching. And they want to be taught. And I believe people leave congregations and leave ministries uh, seeking that teaching ministry because they want to learn or know about the substance or the teachings of the Bible. So it's, it's missing today. In fact, the Bible says in uh, 2 Timothy, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, uh, for correction, uh, for instruction of righteousness, uh, that the man of God may be uh, thoroughly equipped or perfect, um, flirty furnished unto all good works. So the Bible itself even says that this is profitable uh, for doctrine, and doctrine is simply the instruction, uh, the correction uh, in teaching topics or uh, subtopics that contained in the Bible. So, um, having said that, um, we're going to move forward in this lesson, um, and what I want to talk about now and in the beginning of this lesson is the nature of doctrine, the nature of doctrine. So, I want to uh, give you a, a, a understanding of what the nature of doctrine exists of. Now, and as we read the New Testament and the pastoral epistles of Apostle Paul, we find reference to doctrine. So the New Testament is broken up in a few parts, and this is actually called dividing the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of God. There's pastoral epistles, there's the gospel, and then there's the letters of certain apostles, namely uh, Peter and James, and then Apostle Paul. He has his pastoral letters uh, that he has written to various churches, such as the Church of Corinth, the Church of Ephesus, the Church of Galatia. And then finally, we have um, the Acopolyps, or the writing of Apostle uh, St. John uh, when he was on the Isle of Patmos, and uh, he had the vision of Christ, which is the revelation of, of, of Christ himself. So this is the uh, New Testament uh, that we're talking about. We're going to go into some of these um, scriptures here uh, to find and to understand the nature of doctrine. Now, First and Second Timothy, um, there are 16 references to doctrine. So Paul writes young Timothy as a new pastor, as an elder of the church, uh, just instructing him. Um, guiding him. He's a young pastor. Uh, the people that he were pastoring began to frown upon him because of his age, uh, and they felt as though that he's too young to pastor and um, he's not qualified. However, Paul begins to um, encourage uh, young Timothy that this was the calling that was placed upon his life. Um, uh, his grandmother Eunice uh, began uh, to instruct young Timothy as a child in the early, in the, in knowing the scriptures. Uh, and the fruit of that instruction that she gave to him at an early age, uh, he was uh, called into the ministry of the pastor. Now, in a careful study of these references, uh, along with others from the Gospels, the book of Acts and other epistles shows the nature of doctrine. In the pastoral epistles, epistles the doctrine refers to two basic elements. So there's two basic elements when it comes um, to Scripture. Number one, it refers to the art of communicating or teaching the truths of God, okay? It refers to the art of communicating and teaching the truths of God. Now, 1 Timothy 5 and 17 says, let the elders, these are pastors, that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and in the doctrine. So it clearly says it right there that these elders that are pastors over uh, congregations, whether they be large or small, let them be counted worthy of laboring in the word and the doctrine. So there's a difference between word and doctrine. The word was for actually the inspirational, or excuse me, not the inspirational, but the uh, word of the doctrine would be uh, the actual correct teaching of sound doctrine. So he begins to edify uh, young Timothy in this matter. 
uh, Titus 2 and 1. I'm not going to go into that, but the second one would be it refers to the subject matter of the substance of what is being taught. The subject matter or the substance of what is being taught. So if I were to go to 1 Timothy 4 and 6, and I'm going to read that to you. 4 and 6 says that if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of the good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. So the act of teaching involves the content of teaching. So the act of teaching involves the content of teaching. Indoctrination is the continuous act of teaching. Indoctrination is the continuous act of teaching. Now, schools are simply indoctrinating um, institutions. You're indoctrinated for 12 years out of your life. And if you continue to further your uh, college education, there's more indoctrination. So that was, it's a continuous act of teaching. And that's what we call indoctrination. Now, doctrine is also synonymous with the words of faith, sound words, and the faithful word. So in the Bible, doctrine is used synonymous with the words of faith, sound words, and the faithful words. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 6, 2 Timothy 1.13. So I'm going to go to 2 Timothy 1.13. I'm going to take my time tonight because this is a very, uh, very extensive uh, topic. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. And it reads as follows. Hold fast the form of sound words, sound words. Now, I'm going to get a definition. Of that word is logos, which is something said. Okay, something said. Sound words, that is something said. That word sound here in the Greek would be um, to have sound health that is well in body, whether it's figuratively or spiritually, okay? To have sound health that is to be well in the body, okay? Uncorrupt doctrine, to be in health, to be safe, to be whole. So this is the scripture teaching of the Bible. Sound words that will produce health, uh, that would produce wholeness in man. Okay, so we have the scripture says doctrine is the words of faith, sound words, and the faithful word. Second Timothy 3, 3 and 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It profits you, the divine inspiration of God. Breathe out God, breathe upon these apostles to give these particular scriptures to us to put that is profitable for doctrine. Okay, that word doctrine, which means instruction, teaching, for reproof. That word reproof in the scripture means conviction, a conviction that comes from the scriptures. There ought to be a conviction in your life. Some things you ought to feel convicted of when you do after reading the word of God, because the word of God gives conviction. Let's look at the word correction. Well, the correction would simply be the straightening up again. Well, the straightening up again indicates that we were not straight. We were living in immorality. We were blind. We were, we were living in darkness and ignorance. So the word of God has the power to straighten up again. That is the correction. And the other one would be instruction. So that word instruction is chastisement. The word has chastening power. It corrects you. It rebukes you. It doesn't allow you uh, to continue living a lifestyle of habitual sin. So that's the power of God's word. So it has chastening power and in righteousness. So the words of faith, sound words, and the faithful word. Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse 9, says this. Chapter 1 and 9, holding fast the faithful word. This is another word that is used synonymous with doctrine. 
as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So these are three words that are used in the scriptures uh, for the word doctrine. Now, the faith once delivered to the saints is the sum total of the revelation and doctrine as set forth in the word of God that is to be taught and practiced. Doctrine must be sound. In the last days, some will depart from the faith and turn to doctrines of devils and will not endure sound teaching, morally correct, wholesome teaching. They will turn to fables, stories, and traditions of men. Sound doctrine alone preserves from error and makes for the spiritual health and development of the believer. And I'm going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Tim 1 and 9 says this. Knowing this, that the law that is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinner, for the unholy and for the profane, for the murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. So he's speaking here about the, the doctrine as, as far as laws is concerned. Okay, so this is the, what's missing today. We don't have the implication of the word of laws that are contained in the word of God. So they will give heed to uh, uh, these traditions of men, uh, they will turn to fables and they will also not listen to sound doctrine. OK, doctrine must be pure. Job 11 and 4 says my doctrine must be pure. This is God speaking. The test of purity of teaching is the purity of life it produces. So the test of purity of teaching is the purity of life it produces. If there's purity in your life, there's holiness, there's godliness in your life, it is a simple result of your practicing and your understanding and your applying God's word into your life. Doctrine must be scriptural. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, including both the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are profitable for one, for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for conviction. Instruction would be the education and the training and the chastisement. And the correction is to straighten up again. So everything must be tested by the word of God. Scripture must be interpreted by proper principles in order to arrive at a proper exposition. Okay, scripture must be interpreted by proper principles in order to arrive at a proper exposition. Doctrine must be obeyed. We are admonished in the scriptures uh, to be doers and not just hearers only, uh, deceiving yourself. So it must be not only hear the word of God or hear the doctrines, but we must obey the doctrines. All doctrine remains only a lifeless theory until it is practiced. So whatever we're listening to, whatever the teaching is, if we're not applying it to our life and living what we're being uh, told, then it's just a theory. It has no life. It has no power to, to change or to develop the character of, of the individual. No fruit, just a, a void, uh, same selfless, um, lifestyle uh, that people will exhibit because they are not applying the words of God, the doctrine contained in the Bible. Therefore, their life remains fruitless. Just living off of inspiration and just living off of motivation does not produce fruit. It simply give, focuses on giving you a positive attitude and a positive outlook but there's no fruit or no substance in that person's life. Because these persons, if they're not being inspired, I promise you they're not going to stay there very long. Because what they're having now in these church circles is winds of doctrine. Now, if you understand or notice um, the dynamics of a wind, um, the wind blows as it wishes, as Christ says, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from nor where it's going. So these winds of doctrine that have infiltrated the church 
um, are blowing um, and causing people who have these itching ears, who are only seeking to gratify their flesh, to satisfy their carnal desires. That's why the prosperity gospel was so powerful, because it catered to the uh, fleshly desires and the gratifications of people as, as getting wealth from God. So what you hear now, ladies and gentlemen, you have to listen carefully of what's being spoken across these pulpits. Because now what the enemy has done as he has taken the focus off of Christ and he has put the focus of the message on you. I'm going to get back to this message. So now it's about what God can do for you, not what you can do for God. It's, a, it's about what God wants to give you or God wants to bless you with and not what we are required as stewards to be doing for God in these last days. It's obvious. It's very clear, but most people don't see it. They see I'm going to the house of God. I'm going to church because I need God to do this, this, this and the other. Takes the focus off of God, takes the focus off of Christ takes the focus on what we should be doing for the Lord at this particular time, which is crucial. And it, it, it inspires a person to say, well, if I do this, God is going to do this. If I uh, continue to give and to sow seed, God's going to multiply it and give it back to me. So now people have the mindset of going to church in order to get from God. They need a home. They need a car. I need some money. I need a business. You see, it's about what God can do for me now, as opposed to the work and the calling that God has placed upon the believer's life. So it's a lifeless theory until it is practiced. Bible doctrine, no matter how true and scriptural, have no effect on a man's life unless he obeys it. Christ said himself, if any man wills to do his will he shall know concerning the doctrine, and that's the gospel of John 7 and 16. That is, he will know intellectually and experientially, not just in theory. The believers in Rome obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. Now, Christ also warned the believers to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees, because the doctrine of the Pharisees is um, I'm going to tell you what's right. However, I'm not going to do what's right. I'm going to give you the true doctrine of God from the pulpit. However, I'm not going to practice, in a sense, what I preach. I'm going to tell you what's right. And the Bible calls this, Christ himself called this, is uh, called hypocrisy uh, because many are preaching and teaching what is right, but they are not living it. So Christ warned us, he says, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees, Pharisees, they say and do not his will. It was a religion of words without deeds, which constituted hypocrisy. They preached one thing and then they practiced another. The Pharisees were right in their doctrine, but they did not legally and meticulously obey it. All of their theory became a lifeless form. So Christ told us, do what they say, but do not do what they do. Let me repeat that. Do what they say, but do not do what they do. They lived a life that was contrary to the teachings uh, that they were teaching. Herein lies one of the chief dangers in handling the word of God, that it may become truth apart from experience. They were not living the truth. They were speaking the truth, but they were not living and out acting and applying that truth to their life. Therefore, truth that is truth that is not live produces no fruit. As powerful as the word of God is, as a seed as it is, it will have no effect in the believer's life unless it is practiced. If one preaches the doctrine of faith, the doctrine of love, the doctrine of holiness, unity, he must obey that doctrine he preaches, lest he become a modern day Pharisee. Christian living must accompany Christian doctrine. 
Paul told Timothy, you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life. So Paul understood the doctrine of the scriptures and he made it personal because he called it my doctrine and then he exemplified what he lived by telling Timothy my manner of light. In other words, Paul practiced what he preached. He demonstrated to young Timothy the word of God. In fact, the, the scriptures say that we are living epistles read and known from all, of all men. In fact, some people will never uh, come to the house of God. They will never listen to a minister or a preacher or a pastor preach, but they will read your life. So your life must exemplify what you've been taught and what you've heard. And you must preach your life through your, preach the, the, the Bible through your living. Okay. Paul practiced what he preached. Paul's lifestyle reflected his teachings. Doctrine determines character. Now, this is a critical one because many people are in the body of Christ and have been in the body of Christ for years, but their character still remains, still remains the same. They still get angry. They're still mad. They still can't uh, focus and uh, continue to live for Christ. They still get distracted. They're still arrogant. They're still selfish. Their character has not changed because they're not applying this word to their life. They're simply moving, going along with the form of godliness, but they're not, they deny the power. They have no power, no prayer life, no Bible study life, just continuing, going on as a form of godliness, church day, church day, church day, but not having any true character change in their life. And they remain the same. They remain the same uh, uh, mindset as they was when they first got saved. No development, no growth. Because doctrine has not entered into their life. They've heard preaching. They've heard inspirational messages. They've even um, sat down on the ministers. But it hasn't taken root enough to produce a character change in their life. People who have, have can say, yes, I'm not the same I wasn't used to. I wasn't before. I'm not the same person as I was. They've applied that doctrine into their life. They've applied the teachings of the scriptures and now they begin to grow and produce fruit. It is a proven fact that the doctrine determines a person's character. What a person believes greatly affects what he or she is. Believing affects being and being affects doing. If we follow sound doctrine, it will bring about a development of the character of Christ within us. If we follow false doctrine, it will bring about a corruption of character. Doctrine affects, affects fellowship. Doctrine does affect fellowship in that there can be no fellowship unless both parties are both walking in the light. That would be 1 John 1 and 7 and Acts 2 and 2 and 2, uh, excuse me, Acts 2, 42. We find that the early converts of the first Pentecostal continued first in the apostles' doctrine, second in fellowship, third in the breaking of bread, and fourth in prayer. So I'm going to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And this is the order of the uh, apostolic doctrinal teaching. Acts 2.42 says this. And they continued, he's speaking about the apostles and the men and women who were with Christ after he ascended. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And number one, fellowship. Number two, the breaking of bread. Number three, prayers. And I skipped, excuse me, the first one would be doctrine. So they appended in the follows doctrine. They had fellowship. They had the breaking of bread. And then they had prayers. Four distinct um, realities that need to be practiced and placed in the church. Number one was doctrine. Number two was the fellowship. Number three was the breaking of bread, which was communion. And then the last one would be prayers in that specific order. So they had, the apostles had a doctrine. That doctrine came from God, came to Christ. Christ passed it to the apostles. And we are to listen and to obey and follow doctrinal teaching. Now, 
the significance of this order is supported by some of the New Testament epistles. Apostle John wrote to the believers telling them not to receive any who were to come in their house if they did not bring the doctrine of Christ. He also said not to bid them Godspeed lest they become partakers of their evil teachings and their deeds. John taught that the early church should not have fellowship with those who propagate false doctrine. However, we must keep in mind what type of doctrinal issues he is telling us to break fellowship over. He is not giving us a license to denounce um, out fellowship over minor areas of doctrine, rather only when the most fundamental truths are at stake, such as the person of Christ. So here we have uh, denominations who hold specific doctrines of the church, and you have the churches split because they cannot agree over a specific text in Scripture. One person has the interpretation of a text, and then the other group has the interpretation of it. Therefore, you have the church split, and they're divided into different doctrines. And this is not correct according to the Word of God. Because, yes, we're going to have disagreements. Yes, we're not going to see everything eye to eye. Paul and, and uh, Peter, uh, in fact, refuted over certain things until God had to get, bring clarity and understanding to both of them. So, yes, we're going to have minor um, uh, disputes concerning doctrines. But the one doctrine that is needed is the person of Christ or the doctrine of Christ. Now, let me give you an example. You have one denomination who preaches and teaches that we must be baptized in Jesus' name. The other uh, would teach and preach that we must be baptized in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, there are two different doctrinal teachings and two different denominations. Now, is one better than the other? Is one wrong or one right? No, because the scripture clearly says that water is an antitype. Water, the water baptism only signifies an act of obedience. It does not save. It is only through grace, through faith, that we are saved in Christ Jesus. So that's minor to talk about. But the fundamental teachings or the fundamental doctrines that must be uh, addressed is on the doctrine of Christ, because that particular doctrine uh, determines your destiny uh, and your final resting place. All right. So now, good topic. Though may some may sacrifice uh, fellowship for doctrine, neither should we be sacrificed doctrine for fellowship. In other words, we, we have to put it in the right perspective, not leaving a particular ministry uh, because we disagree with certain doctrines. Uh, but that main particular doctrine on Christ should be addressed and should be announced. And you should know this prior. You should know this prior to joining any ministry in any church. Know concerning the doctrine, because if uh, that doctrine is being taught there is going to determine, number one, your character, number two, your, your life, number three, and your eternal destiny, which I'm getting ready to talk about now. Doctrine determines your destiny. Your destiny is not here on earth. You're, what you're here on earth is your purpose, your calling. Your destiny is after you expire from this earth, that's where, you, where your destiny is. You're only destined to two places, ladies and gentlemen, that's heaven and hell. And doctrine is going to determine where you go after you give your last breath here. It is that it is that important to know what you're teaching and what's being taught to you, because what's being taught to you is an indoctrination. What's being said to you and spoken to you by leaders is indoctrination. It's words and words carry weight and words carry authority in the realms of the spirit. So whoever's speaking, whatever place that they're speaking from, or whatever spirit they're motivated by, it's going to manifest in your life. That's why it's very critical to understand the doctrines of the church so that we can discern what is true doctrine of God, what is false doctrine of God, what is being correctly taught, and what is incorrectly being taught today. Who and what we believe in affects our destiny. Who and what we believe in affects our destiny. It is a vain statement to say that it does not matter what a person believes as long as they are sincere. I've heard this many a times. And we, you people here today, God knows my heart. 
God knows my heart. Well, guess what? Your heart can be sincerely wrong, even though you think it's okay. Now, there are many people inside Christianity and other religions who are genuinely sincere, okay? But sincerely wrong because they don't know concerning the doctrine. It's not enough to just say, I am sincere, and because of my sincerity makes it right. It doesn't make it right. Sincerely wrong, sincerely destined for a place that they would probably uh, knew if they were what they were going to would determine it would change it because we're listening to false teaching and false doctrines and we're not listening to what the actual Bible says because nobody want to take the time out to read and study. People today are fashioned and groomed to go to listen to a leader say, and I understand leaders and those who are in position have authority can, and have been ordained and commissioned to bring this word to you under the authority of God, but many do not. Many do not. Many do not have God's anointing on their life. Many do not have the calling upon their life. They're teaching the Bible as a, from a profession stance. As I've been, I've been, I've, I've went to school. I've got my education. I've got my degree. Now I'm going to go forth. No calling. The Bible says you have no need that any man should teach you, but the same anointing will teach you all things and is the truth. The Bible says it itself. You don't need a man to teach you. The anointing will do that. The anointing is truth. He will lead and guide you into all truth. It never says to go to a theological seminary or Bible school to learn about the word of God, to be taught. And this is what's crept in the church today. And what you hear and what I see here today is things that's being passed down from pastor to pastor, from one generation to the next generation, not teaching any substance, just partially cutting this Bible in half. And I'm going to tell you the New Testament, but I'm not going to talk that about that Old Testament. Because if you ask one Christian, they can quote. Many Christians can quote the New Testament. They know about the back of their hand. But tell me something from the Old Testament. Because they've been taught. They've been taught only from the New Testament. They've disregarded the old when the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Not just the New Testament. Now, there are many people inside Christians, Christianity and other religions who are genuinely sincere but are sincerely wrong. Proverbs itself says in 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death, separation from God, bondage. Seems right, feels right, looks right. Everybody else is doing it. Doesn't make it right. And this is what happens. And this is what is happening now. The enemy has proposed and placed something that looks right, feels right, Everybody else is doing it must be right. But the end is alienation and death from God, both physical and then spiritual in the end. Now, it is our relationship to Christ which affects our eternal destiny. The last state of existence, which means you don't cease to exist after you die. You continue to exist. There is a consciousness that will never ever, quote unquote, die. OK, so death is not a cease to existence. Death is simply a transition into another eternal state, a state that there is called forever or eternity where there is no end. That's the, the, the next state that we are appointed to. Like the book of Hebrews says, every male, we're all appointed to death. We all have appointment. OK. Unless Christ comes back soon, we don't have a point. We don't escape that. But if he doesn't, we're appointed to that. So when the Bible sp speaks about the ways of death that seemeth right to a man, people think this is right because it's a tradition. It's been passed down. We've been doing it for thus and thus and thus and thus for so many years. It must be right. You got to bring it through the scriptures. You got to bring it through the scriptures because the scriptures is going to have the last say so on the correction on what is right and what is wrong. 
So the question Pope poses here in Matthew 22, 42 and 27, 22, I'm going to read them. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And what will you do with Jesus who is called Christ? Matthew, the gospel according to St. Matthew 22 and 42 says thus. Matthew 22, 42 says, now Christ here is speaking to the Pharisees. And he says, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And this is the, listen to what they answered him. They say unto him, the son of David. Son of David. Okay. Now, few hours later, uh, he spoke to Peter and asked Peter, who do you say that I am, Peter? Peter confessed, thou art the son of God. Christ said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. These Pharisees did not see that. They did not see that he was Christ. They saw him according to the flesh. And yes, they were right. He was the son of David according to the flesh. But in the book of Romans chapter one, he says he was the son of God, according to what? The spirit of holiness, according to his deity, he was the son of the true and living God. They missed it. They saw him according to the flesh. So these two pivotal uh, questions are, go are asked, being asked or should be asked today in the church. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Is he a prophet, as some religions believe that he is? Is he a man just filled with God, as some people say he is? Is he the son of David, as some people believe and say that he is? Half truth, half lie. They have not seen or understand that Christ is the son of God or God revealed or manifested in the flesh. Even the Jews reject him to this day. They still believe that their Christ is, is soon to return. In fact, the Jews of the time that Christ was alive killed him because he said he was the Christ. He was their Messiah and they, and they rejected him. So they did not see. They were blind. Whose son is he? And what will you do with this Jesus who was called Christ? Matthew 27 and 22 says thus, Matthew 27, 22. And this is where Christ is speaking also to the, uh, what's this, me, actually this is Pilate saith unto them. So this is the governor answered and said unto them, uh, whither of two will ye release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. So this is the time of, of, of Christ was at Pilate's, uh, the governor's uh, uh, palace there. And they had Christ and they also had Barnabas. And Pilate asked, who do you want me to release, Barnabas or Christ? And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, nothing but rather the tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person Ye see to it. Verse 22 says this. Pilate said unto them, what shall you do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And this is the response of the Jews. They all say unto him, let him be crucified. Let him die. So these two pivotal questions are very important. Now, it is our answer to these two questions that a person's eternal destiny hangs. The prophet Isaiah in his speaking to the nation of Israel referred to a principle which God used to progressively reveal doctrine in scripture. Isaiah 26 and 9, 13, he set forth the question and the answer and the method of divine inspiration. So we're going to go to the book of Isaiah chapter number 22. Excuse me, 26. 
and verse 42. 26.9, I'm sorry. 26.9 and 13. All right. And it says, With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, and my spirit within me will I seek early, with thy judgments are in the earth the inhabitants of the world of righteousness. Uh, let thy favor be shown unto the wicked, yea, he not learn. Let me skip down to the verse 13, says here. O Lord, who ordained peace, for thou art him who wrought and hid our works. Okay. All right, so the question here says, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he understand to teach doctrine? Isaiah begins to answer it and says, they that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the, from the breast. In other words, who is going to understand and who is going to receive doctrine? The answer would, that Isaiah said was that they are weaned from the milk, the milk of the word, the basic principles of the word, and them that are drawn from the breast. He's talking about the infancy or those who are babes in Christ who will begin to understand, who will receive the kingdom of heaven with humility. Those are the ones that are able to be taught and to understand doctrine. Then he begins to explain the method. Now, it's ironic how the Bible itself teaches you how to study it. But man, in his ignorance, goes to school. It's written right here. God shows you and tells you how to study his word. And this is the method. For the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's it. It's just that simple. A precept are scriptures, a, 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 a text of scripture. That scripture will interpret this scripture. This scripture will interpret this scripture. This scripture will interpret this scripture, so forth and so forth, until you have a whole of uh, context, and then you have that context to interpret a particular topic or lesson or teaching you want to expound on. It's just that simple. There's no education needed involved when you precept the scripture, when you understand how the Bible clearly uh, can interpret itself. Once we understand the method of how to understand and interpret the Bible. This is God's method of teaching the Bible or teaching doctrine. God did not give the full revelation of himself at once. From Adam to Moses, a period of approximately 2,500 years, 2,500 years. There was no written word. There was no word. From Adam to Moses... They did not have a Bible. The Bible wasn't written. There was nothing there. They simply had to trust and believe God. That's why God was so powerful and manifested himself because they didn't need faith. So it was visible manifestations of God, visible manifestations of angels, uh, visible spiritual encounters that these men of faith experienced because it was no need of faith in the sense that we have it right now. So they had no Bible. The, the, the scriptures was not written. They just had to believe God in their heart. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it accounted unto him for righteousness. No revelation of God in the scripture form. The promises of redemption were in the hearts and mouths of the early fathers, which would be Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. While the heavens declared the gospel story in signs and wonders. Now, God is so awesome. He wrote the gospel in the sky. And he told Abraham, I want you, Abraham, and I'm paraphrasing it. I want you to go out and I want you to count the number of the stars that you see. Which would be innumerable to be able to count. And then I said, he said, I want you to count the sand on the seashore that you're standing on which is normal. Well, the stars would represent the Jews and then the sand are the Gentiles. Jew and Gentile will be saved under uh, the atonement work of Jesus Christ. 
So God wrote the gospel story in the stars, which we call today, and if you, you can see them, constellations. That's the gospel. He wrote it amongst the stars. We don't see stars today because there's no need to see the stars today or see the constellations today because we have the Bible, the scriptures, the Holy Writ itself. So from Adam to Moses, a period of 2,500 years, there was no written word, no revelation of God in scripture form. The promises were in the hearts and the, in the mouths of the early fathers, while the heavens declared the glory of God. The glory of God. Let's look at Psalms 19. The book of Psalms, chapter 19, says thus. Psalms 19 and 1 reads as follows. Okay, he says, the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare, the heavens reveal, the heavens speak the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth his knowledge. There is no speech or language in their land where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And he hath set a tabernacle in them, which is the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices at the strong man to run. So the heavens declare the glory of God. The glory of the gospel was written amongst the stars in which we have the constellations today. God inspired Moses to write the, the Pentateuch or the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible from Genesis to Deuteronomy covering a period of 2,500 years. Now, no one actually knows the, uh, how the Pentateuch or how the God revealed, uh, because Moses was not there in Genesis. Moses did not see the creation of the world, mind you. Moses did not come till 2,500 years later. So how did he know all of this information about Adam and Eve and about the garden and everything? Well, scholars and theologians have uh, 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 presumed that some course when Moses was on these mo this mountain, he was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, he'd either eat, eat, eat or drink, that God showed him the creation of the world. That God revealed to him and he saw this and he wrote it in a book. See, he wrote it in a book, the book of the law, which we have today. He wrote it in Hebrew because he was a Hebrew, so God was speaking to him in the Hebraic language, not the English language which we have today. He wasn't an English person, he was a Hebrew. So he, he was showed him everything from Genesis all the way up until the point that Moses gave his last, last breath. And then finally, uh, Joshua, who was Moses' assistant, uh, began to write the, the further books because Moses had deceased when he was um, on the mountain. So the Pentateuch was the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, to cover a period of 2,500. The 39 books of the Old Testament took approximately 1,100 years to record. No one patriarch, prophet, priest, king, or saint even received the whole doctrine of God at once, but they received it precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It wasn't fully revealed to them. God began to dis expose or began to reveal himself little by little until we have today our Bible, which is written uh, according to the canon of scripture, which we have today. So God at various times, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter one, and in many different ways, many fragmented, many manner, many portions, many ways spoke in past, in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. The fathers would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the prophets. So God communicated his mind and his will in the Old Testament times by signs, by shadows, by types, by examples, by figures, by allegories, dreams, visions, angelic manifestations, and prophetic voices. So this was the method that God used 
in revealing his plan and revealing himself to mankind through these particular avenues or these modes of of communication. There was no single way God communicated with man. He's sovereign. He chose to reveal Mo to Moses as a burning bush, as a fire. He uh, revealed himself through dreams to Jacob and visions. He used angels all the way up until Christ. Uh, the Bible says that uh, the angel came up here before Mary, uh, Gabriel. Uh, so these are all angelic manifestations uh, under the old covenant or the Old Testament, rather, to God to reveal his purpose and his plan to his people. Now, in the New Testament times, the doctrinal revelation came through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and through the holy apostles. And the finality of God's revelation and doctrinal instruction is consummated in Christ. So when Christ came, he is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He is the express image of his person. So when God uh, brought forth the Son of God and manifested him, he is the express image. He is the all, the totality of God is in Christ. We don't need to go outside of Christ to find truth as the truth is in Jesus. Now, he is the express image of God. He is the oracle or the speaking place. Now, through a compilation of many books, the Bible is to be viewed as one harmonious whole with truth being progressively revealed throughout. So the Bible is many books. All of these books are divisions. They're, they're actually from the Dead Sea Scrolls that was found. So there were scrolls and they put the scrolls all together to formulate what we have today, the Bible, 66 books of the Bible. That's why they're called books or biblical or biblica, which is in the Greek. So all of this can, constitutes our Bible, which were simply books that were divinely inspired by men. God breathed upon these men, inspired them to write what we call today the Holy Scriptures or the Holy Writ. Now, there are other books that men were writing back at this time, which very few people do not want to investigate because they have this mind thinking that all we need is the word of God. Well, that's not always the case. There's many books out there that Jewish people were writing at this particular time, along with historical facts that complement the Bible. Even Paul said, bring the books. When he told Timothy, he was coming to visit him. So Paul read other literatures too. And one of the books that has been hidden from us is number one, the Apocrypha, uh, which complements, which kind of fill in the gaps. Because there are times when you read the Bible and, it, and, and you don't quite understand what's saying. However, if you read these other, other books, mind you, the Apocrypha for one, uh, you will begin a, a, a understanding of what God is saying and uh, understand the historical part of the scriptures. Now, the Bible, again, let me read this to you again. The Bible is to be viewed as one harmonious whole with truth being progressively revealed throughout each book is a part of a whole. The Bible, the books are a part of a whole. They are parts of a whole. You cannot take a part and then elaborate on it. And this is what's wrong, what's happening to, to, to the church today. They're taking a, a, a text of scripture and then they just talk about that text. When that scripture goes all the way back, if you take a scripture out of the New Testament, you've got to go all the way back to the Old Testament, even to understand what this New Testament scripture is saying. And this is what's happening to the church. That's why you have this inspirational, motivational preaching, because there's no substance there. There's no topical uh, uh, foundation for people to, to, to be able to grow and mature on because they're looking the Bible as just textual verses and inspirational verses, not, not bringing the whole of Scripture together and making a, a topic out of it. All right. So each book is a part of a whole and cannot be understood apart from its relation to the whole. Each book is a part of a whole and cannot be understood apart from its relation to the whole. In order to, for me to understand the New Testament, I've got to first understand the Old Testament because the New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. I need both. 
You cannot continue to preach and teach from New Testament when you don't know Old Testament preachers, pastors, bishops, apostles, whatever you call yourself. You must understand Old Testament. And now you have Christians who are quick. They understand New Testament. They can quote all things work together for good for them that love God. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you ask them, give me a verse from the Old Testament. They can't go there because it's not being taught because now the church is strictly a New Testament church. The way God progressively revealed truth in Scripture suggests the way in which the Bible student should handle the doctrines of Scripture, bringing together all that the Bible has to say on the subject to formulate the doctrine of it and arrange the elements of that doctrine in a systematic order. And that's a lot. Let me read it again. The way God progressively revealed truth in Scripture suggests the way in which the Bible student should handle the doctrines of Scripture, bringing together all the Bible has to say on a subject to formulate the doctrine of it and arrange the elements of the doctrine in a systematic order. Form it all, putting it together. We take all the precepts of Scripture from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. Then you got a doctrine. Then you have a teaching. You can't just take two verses or three verses from the New Testament and then teach on it. Won't work. That's false. You got to take the old and you got to take the new, formulate it all together, and down you have the substance of the Scriptures. All doctrine must arise out if and be found firmly upon the only absolute authority in man's position, possession, which is the inspired word of God. You can't get doctrine from any other books except the Bible. You can't get it from the Quran. You can't get it from the Apocrypha. You can't get it from the book of the Latter-day Saints. You can't get it from any other book. This is the final authority. This is the final say-so. This is infallible. This is without error. Now, what happened is it turns to error when you get man to begin to incorrectly misunderstand or misinterpret the teaching. Now you have error. There's nothing wrong with this book. This book is the absolute and sole authority and pillar of truth. What is wrong is the teaching of it. What is wrong is the interpretation of it. And now you have a lot of heresy and false teaching, a lot of questions arising from saints. They don't understand. They don't know. They're confused. They don't know what to do. Neither does the pastor because he hasn't been properly trained and understood how you interpret, how you, you interpret scripture and how you precept the scripture from the Old and the New Testament to formulate a doctrine, a substance of teaching. So this happens on from generation to generation, and now you have a group of people, which is this today, who say, you know what? We're not even going to worry about this because it takes too much time. It takes too much time to study and to learn and to go back and to understand that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Give it that to the people and let them live on that. Now you have a lot of inspiration and motivational teaching but no sound doctrine because after it comes a point in a time, in a time where you want to be taught, you're tired of being preached to, you're tired of being yelled at. In fact, preaching was never, des never designed by Christ for saints. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations beginning at Jerusalem, teaching them to observe all things that I said. It wasn't designed for saints. It was designed for sinners. Preaching is designed to, to bring down the stronghold and the blindness and the arrogance and the, the, uh, the ignorance of the sinner so that the, the gospel light of Christ can penetrate through that darkness area and then they will come to repentance and again salvation. That's what preaching is for. Teaching is for the saints, not preaching. Got it twisted around now. That's man's ignorance. That's how man views and looks at things because now we live in a world where it's not about what I can do for God. It's what I need God to do for me. The doctrine of Christ, very important doctrine. This is, the, this is a fundamental truth. If you don't get this right and people don't get this right, that's going to determine your destiny because you have to answer that question. 
Whose son is he? And what will you do with Christ that you now that you have him? So no, there's no dialogue. There's no dialogue with any religion, any bishop, any pastor, any priest, if we can't agree on whose son is he. Because either you're going to be like the Pharisees and say he's the son of David according to the flesh, or you're going to confess and be like Peter and says, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God, which is revelation that came from God. And many people don't, many people are deceived in when it comes to whose son is he? Who is Jesus to you? Is he the son of David? Is he the son of Mary? Or is he the son of God? Because that question hangs your eternal destiny. Scripture reveals that the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God. And I'm, I'm not going to go deep into this because um, uh, this is this is very, very extensive when it comes to the doctrine of Christ. Uh, but I will finish it next week. All right. So Christ, Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God who always existed with the father and the Holy Spirit and who by his incar incarceration and in incarnation, excuse me, took upon himself the form of man and became the God man. Now, I've heard it and I still continue to hear it. People say Jesus became a man. That is wrong. He did not become a man. I understand what people are saying when they say that, but that lets me know they don't know doctrine because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says he came in the form difference. The form of man. He was not a man. He came in the form of man. Now, he took upon himself the form of man and became the God man. In the one person of Christ, there are two natures. And this is where, this is where the heresy starts. This is where it all began. When Christ ascended to the Father, let me tell you, every demon of hell attacked the church and went in to destroy and to corrupt the pure, wholesome teaching of God's words. And Christ warned them. Apostle Paul warned them that they will come in with destructive heresies. They will come in, lie in wait to deceive the, the most simple um, they will come in as wolves in sheep's clothing because Satan was infuriated that he did not see the plan of God. Because had he had seen the plan of God, he would have never crucified Christ. He would have never murdered him. But that power was given, that power was given to Satan because the power of darkness uh, was transferred while Jesus Christ was in the Garden of, Sin of Gethsemane. It was hidden from Satan that he thought that if I kill the Christ, I can destroy and continue to rule the entire world, which now belongs to Satan and doesn't belong to God because he's the God of this world. See, this, this, all this stuff, God does not rule the world. Satan does. God rules the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of the earth. It don't talk about the world. It says he's the God of this world. So this point about Christ, we have to understand who Christ was. In the one person of Christ, there are two natures, human and divine, each in its completeness and integrity. They are distinguishable, but indivisible. So he is fully man and fully God. It is this sinless union of the divine and the human nature, which qualifies him to be the only sacrificial mediator between God and man. He's, he's God. Christ is different from any of us. He is different. He is not human in the sense that we are. He is human possessing humanity, but still being God. Let me show you in the gospels are presented uh, two of the most important questions relative to the Lord Jesus Christ. These qu questions were asked by Christ himself of the religious leaders of his day and by Pilate of the multitude seeking to bring about the crucifixion of Christ.
And I believe I just read them to you was Matthew 22. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? The plan of salvation as revealed by God in Jesus Christ is dependent on the answers to these two questions. What a person believes about Jesus will determine how he or she relates to Christ. This will in turn determine that person's eternal destiny. The Bible declares that Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God, who by his virgin birth, sinless humanity, vicarious death, burial, and resurrection made the perfect sacrifice for sin, thereby making redemptive available for fallen man. Apart from who he is and what he has done, there is absolutely no way of approach to God the Father by him. So the doctrine of Christ falls into two categories. The person of Christ, who he is, and the work of Christ, what he has done. There are a full range of diverse views and heresies that center around the person and the work of Christ. All religions must be tested in their doctrine by their view of Christ's person and work. Now, I'm going to go before I'm going to go into the orthodox view. I'm going to go into some of the heresies um, that are existing today and that existed at the time of Christ's departure. All the basic heresies concerning the person of Christ were manifested in seed form during the time of the early church and were dealt with in the Gospels and epistles of all the apostolic writers. There are actually no new heresies today. Rather, all are revivals of ancient ones. It was also due to these heresies that the various councils of the patriotic church gathered together to formulate doctrinal statements and creeds to defend biblical Christiology. The following of, the, of them are the most prominent heresies concerning the person of Christ, which false cults in Christianity base their religion upon. Now, it's hidden. It's hidden and it's nooked in Christianity like never before. It manifested, it revealed itself in seed form, but it's hidden under Christianity. One of the biggest religions, you got Christianity, you've got uh, Islam, okay, two big religions out there, um, and it's hidden in, let's speak about Christianity. Sorry to say, Christianity is, is the cloak, if, if I would say, the hide this false teaching. And it's very subtle, very subtle. You've got to be trained with, the, uh, with an eye to see it. And if you don't, you'll be led astray along with this, this, this false teaching. Let's give me some, I'm going to give you some early examples. One group of people was called the Ebenites. Were Jewish believers that arose early in the second century. Their name in Hebrew means Ebion, which means be poor, to be humble and depressed. Because of their poverty, they regarded themselves as the only true disciples of Christ. You ever, you ever heard that growing up? In other words, the more poor you are, the more humble you are, the more you got God. That originated out of the Hebrew rites. Started way back then, crept into the church, naming on the Pentecostal because at, the, at one point in time, Pentecostals couldn't be rich. No, 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 no. You couldn't have gold. You couldn't have jewelry. You couldn't, you couldn't have wealth because that would mean you are backslidden and you are away from God. So the poorer you are, the holy you are. <laughs> That's a lie. Came from the Ebonites. Watch this. Because of their poverty, they regarded themselves as the only true disciples of Christ. And the Ebonites believed that the Mosaic and the Jewish ceremonies were still binding them to Christian believers. Okay, they uphold the law. They kept the law. That's fine. I understand that. While upholding the teachings of Peter and James, they disliked Paul's writings. Colossians 2 uh, and 13, which refutes Jewish ceremonialism and being nailed to the cross and no longer binding to the believer in Christ before their influence that had faded away in 135 after death, after AD, they had divided into two different groups. The Pharisistic Ebonites, who were successors of the Judaizers of Paul days, and the Essenic 
Ebionites who were more tolerant in their treatment of the uncircumcised Gentile believers that did not keep the Sabbath nor the Jewish customs. The major heresy of the Ebionites concerned the person of Christ. They denied that Christ had a divine nature and discontinued his supernatural conception. In denying Christ's deity, they viewed him merely as a man. So they rejected his deity. He didn't come from God. He was just a man. And therefore, they uh, began to subvert and to persuade many, many people out of this false teaching. They rejected his deity because it contradicted the fact of God's oneness. In other words, they strictly held that God is one. It's impossible for God to be three. He can't be Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He has to, he's one God, one Lord, which the Bible does teach. And they couldn't wrap their minds around it. How can it be God be one, but yet three? And it's still a mystery to most people. It's hard to understand. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. How can God be one God, but yet three? We don't understand it. God is God. He's one and he's three. But they had a problem with Christ being the son of God because now Christ said, I am God also. And they couldn't wrap their minds around it. Therefore, they rejected it and because it went against God's oneness. They taught that if Jesus were God, it would contradict monotheism, which is monos, meaning one, theos, meaning God, one God. And they were monotheistic in their belief. Therefore, they rejected Christ as being the son of God which is the belief that there is only one and true God. There are modern cults today which are counterparts of this heresy and deny the deity of Christ. They reduce Christ as a mere man, as a man filled with God, as a man who was influenced by God, as a man who is a prophet of God, as a man um, who loved God. This is the heresy that's in the church today. Now, the Gnostics or Gnosticism, which we would get our word agnostic, um, which means a person who uh, believes that there's something, but they don't call it God. They call it something else. They believe that there's a supernatural power. They believe there's a supreme being. They believe that there's something out there. They believe that there's a creator. They believe that some, some there's, a, there's, there's an existence of a higher spiritual power that created the earth, but they don't acknowledge him. These are called Gnostics or agnosticisms. So the Gnostics appeared about the same time as the Ebionites, though they went to the other extreme denying the full humanity of Christ. The Gnostics were also called uh, dotasi, meaning to seem or to appear, because their views of the person of Christ. There were basically three groups of Gnostics that held the same heretical views of Christ's humanity. The Dota say this group denied the reality of Christ's body, saying his body was a mere phantom or an appearance. It wasn't real. It didn't have any tangible substance. The Gnostics, this group taught that Christ had a real body, but denied the fact that it was physical or material. They believed that he was a spirit body. It wasn't it wasn't a human body as we as we supposed because they believed at the time that the flesh was inherently evil. Okay, as the scripture said, there's no good thing that dwells in the flesh. So they interpreted this verse well. If there's no good thing that dwells in the flesh, then uh, what is the purpose of flesh? And why do we have the flesh? And, and what, what, what is it? If it's evil, which it is not, a, the only purpose for your flesh is to keep you alive and to keep you here on earth. Your flesh and your physical body is designed to house your spirit and your soul so that you don't float out of space and to keep you in the physical realm um, to do the work and the will of the Lord. Other than that, it's pretty much that's it. The flesh goes back to the dust. It returns back to the dust. The spirit returns back to God and, and it goes from there. So they believe that because the flesh was evil, he did not have flesh. So they say they believe that since the flesh was inherently evil, Christ's body could not have been a fleshly one because they couldn't understand that. How could the son of the living God, the Messiah, the Christ himself come in an evil body when the prophecies said that he was the holy one? that he would, the righteous one, that he was the lamb. They couldn't understand it, so they rejected that. Another group was called the Cerithians, 
A Gnostic by the name of Synthorius taught that Jesus Christ and Christ were two distinct persons. I, I heard that before. They believed and I, that Christ um, was the spirit. I've heard this teaching. Christ was the spirit that came upon him uh, during the water baptism. Now, if you recall the story in the Gospels, how Jesus Christ was at the uh, water, the, the Jordan River, Jordan River, excuse me, and John baptized him. And the Bible said the spirit of God descending upon Christ. And um, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So they believe that he became Christ at that moment. And the part of Christ, the part of Jesus was just his humanity. Up until that point, he was just a mere man. And then at the point that he was baptized and the spirit of Christ came upon him, the spirit of God came upon him, that he became Christ. So I'm going to read a little bit further. So they believed that Jesus and Christ were two distinct people. Jesus was an ordinary man, the son of Joseph and Mary, and Christ was the spirit or the power of God, which descended upon him at his baptism in the Jordan River. They taught that Christ departed from Jesus at his crucifixion, <laughs> leaving him to suffer and die alone. And they get that verse, they get that teaching from when the Bible says when Christ yielded up his spirit or he gave up the ghost, they said that was the spirit of Christ, leaving, to, leaving Jesus to die on the cross alone. These Gnostic heresies are eluded and to dealt and dealt with by the epistles and the uh, Colossians, First Timothy, Second uh, Timothy, First John, Jude, and Revelation. The Arians or the Arians was a presbyter, or Arius was a presbyter of Alexandria in Egypt. Now this man was a bishop in the Lord's Church, named Arius. The teaching of Arius relates more properly to the doctrine of God rather than to the person of Christ. However, they cannot be totally separated from each other. The Arians taught that Christ did not pre-exist, that he was a created being, and that by him all things were created. In his create, created state, he was called the Logos, the Son, the only begotten, and the beginning of of the creation of God. Arius taught that though the son was called God, he was not God in the fullest sense of the word, but was the highest of all created beings. That's where you have that church where comes in. Mormonism really expound that. They believe Christ is a created being, that he existed as the word or the logos, and they interpret that scripture is because the Bible says in, in uh, 1 John, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Therefore, they distinct him being from being separate from God and that he was a created, created being um, from God. In his created state, excuse me. So he existed as the Logos, the Son of God, the only begotten, the beginning of the creation of God, beginning of the creation of God. That's what the Bible says, the beginning of the creation of God, as if God created Christ. And Arius taught that he, though he was the Son of God and was called God, he was not God in the fullest sense of the word. He was divine, but not deity, a demigod halfway between God and man. Arianism was condemned during the years of 321-325 A.D. All right, they condemned him uh, by Alexandria, uh, the, another bishop of Alexandria. And Arius was dismissed from holding any church office as well as from communion. So his heresy uh, became exposed, and the bishop of Alexandria uh, condemned him. Uh, back in that time, they expelled him from the church. Uh, he wasn't allowed to do any particular office, and they took his rights uh, to partake in the Lord's Supper, which is Holy Communion. This heresy denies the eternity of the co-equality of Christ's person with the Father and the Holy Ghost, making him a created being only. The Apollyarians is where we get the uh, 
god of Apollos, which was a god in Rome. Apollarius was a notable bishop of the church of Laodicea, written in the book of Revelations, but he wasn't at that, at, at that particular time. He taught, and listen, 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 these are people, who, these are bishops. These are people in offices, in high ranking offices. A bishop is a pastor of a pastor and they were teaching false doctrines. He taught that Christ had a true body and an animal soul, but not a rational spirit or mind. Because in the difficulty in explaining the union of the two natures in the one person of Christ, he taught that the eternal son was the divine or the spirit part of Jesus. That, that, that teaching is still relevant today. They teach that Jesus is the man and Christ is the spirit and that the spirit of Christ is in Jesus. That's wrong. That, that's not what the Bible teaches. This teaching denies the completeness of Christ's human nature, teaching that he, Christ, has only two parts instead of a full and total humanity of spirit, soul, and body. It rejects that teaching. As Christ was 100% man, he was 100% God. He wasn't less of either one. Apollinarianism was condemned by the Council of Constantinople in 301 AD as being heretical. And this is my last one, and I'm going to close. The Nestorians, Nestorius, Bishop of Constantinople, taught concerning the person of Christ that there was a dual personality involved. He denied the real union of the divine and the human nature in Christ, saying that the logos in the beginning was the word, the logos, the discourse, the divine personality dwelt in Christ in the human form, which would be Jesus, making two related persons. <laughs> he presented Christ as a spirit filled man only. A man filled with God only without true deity and true humanity in the one person of Christ. Now, how many of us heard that before? You, you ask people from other religions and you ask them, who's Christ? Who is, who's Christ to you and who is he? Oh, he was a man filled with God. Oh, he was a man that was spirit filled. He was a man that was greatly used by God. Oh, he was a man that, uh, that was a prophet. False heresies. But without true deity and true humanity in one person. Cyro, a man named Cyro in Alexandria, opposed Nestorius' teaching, and Nestorius was condemned and banished by the synagogue of Ephesus in 431. Notice I'm saying A.D. because all this happened after Christ uh, ascended to the Father, and he was uh, condemned and banished as being heretical uh, and, and false teachings. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, um, the doctrine of Christ. Uh, the next... Uh, Next week, God permits, I will go on to the correct teaching of who Christ is and explain to you because that scripture in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. It, 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 it takes a lot of investigation. And I understand because it can be uh, confusing rather, but it is not. There's a logical explanation of how can God be himself, but yet be with himself. Well, just to give you a, 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 a touching, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. You can't separate yourself from your thoughts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So uh, briefly, and I, I don't want to get into detail, I want to save it. The word was the thought or the mind, the expression of God. It was the plan of God in the mind of God. And I'm going to leave it with that. That's why... The word can be with God and yet still be God, because as you think, so are you. Uh, you can't separate yourself from your own thoughts. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I want to pray because I feel a sense of need to pray for people here that's viewing this broadcast and will view this replay of this broadcast because it seems like many people are a little a bit shy or rather to view the actual live broadcast. But the, the ratings, I see the views of people who are seeing this viewcast and um it keeps going more and more. So people are watching this broadcast, but for some reason they don't want to come on live. So they have their reasons. So anyway, um, I want to pray 
first of all, um, about uh, the situation of this nation, um, because we definitely need prayer, because uh, no man has the answer, and uh, uh, no man will have the answer according to the Bible. Uh, the book of Ezekiel chapter, I believe, uh, 37, excuse me, Deuteronomy 68 said, no man will, able, will, will buy you, uh, which means no man will be able to have the answer to what we're going through. And I, I do believe, okay, and many people, you can differ with me, and that's fine, that this coronavirus, this situation that we're in is a result of hypocrisy in the pulpit. I do believe that. I believe, I believe God has had enough of the hypocrisy. I believe God is, is fed up. Um, with the lies that are being propagated across the pulpit. I believe the church has failed God on the issues of racism. Uh, they have not been addressed. They have not been dealt with. Therefore, God has left the church and, and is now using another younger generation who are fearless, who are courageous um, to uh, uh, bring about uh, freedom and bring about change, which it actually should be. The church and church leaders should have done that. Um, but Again, we're all responsible for that because uh, we have not done what God has called us to do. So I believe this coronavirus is indeed a judgment. It is a judgment. Yes. When God begins to judge people, um, he does it with three things. He does it with the sword. He does it with famine and he does it with pestilence. It's all through the Bible. He uses the sword, which is death. He uses pestilence, which is famine. And he uses um uh, sword, pestilence, and famine, and, and he uses a lack of food um, and a lack of resources. So he judges us by the sword. The sword is simply death. Man has a gun. Policemen have gun. They kill us. Okay. He uses pestilence, which is diseases. We have the coronavirus, which is today. And then, of course, we have famine. We have a lack of food and a lack of, of things. So those are the things that he judges us with. And that's what we're experiencing today um, as a result of this COVID-19 uh, to, to get our attention, it is to get our attention uh, because we have been easily distracted uh, by things, um, small things. Uh, we've, 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 see, the, the children of Israel, and I'm going to try to stay on my subject, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, they loved God. They loved Yahweh. They loved Jehovah. But they also loved other gods. So the Bible says that the children of Israel would rise up um, to eat and then they would go play simply meaning that they came to church on Sunday and they worshiped God. But then through the week, uh, they followed other strange gods. And God sees this. It's, it's not hidden from the eyes of God. And the church is in that condition. You have church people today who love God, but they love other gods. And we have to get these gods out of our life. We have to repent. We have to remove everything because God is a jealous God and come back to the one and only true God and the teaching and the doctrines of scripture. So I'm going to pray for this, this world today and um, how the spirit leads me. Um, we'll continue to go from there. So wherever you are, I need you to join me in spirit. We can't touch and agree like the Bible says, but we can touch and agree in the spirit realm and believe God by faith. Father, we thank you for this hour that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you uh, for this uh, scriptural uh, teaching of sound words, I pray, uh, that has been released now, and as you have given it to me, I've given it to them. And I pray that these words would be uh, at a, a place in their heart that, that would sow as seeds, uh, seeds into their life, Lord, that would produce good fruit, uh, that it would produce a harvest in their life, whatever they are desiring, whatever they are needing from you at this hour, God. You, you see the needs and you see the, the hearts and the minds of your people today. God, this nation is in distress. This nation is filled with chaos and confusion. Uh, this nation has uh, turned its back on you in so many ways, from the political to the religious circles. Uh, we have forsaken the one and truly God and we need to repent. God, I can't repent for this nation, um, but I can only as a uh, minister, as an intercessor, stand in the gap, God, to call on your name, that you would be merciful uh, to those of us who have uh, repented, merciful and kind uh, to those of us who have forsaken um, the gods of the past and have turned and are looking ever toward you because you're the faithful and only true God. God, we thank you for another hour and opportunity. This week has come to a close 
and we're at the beginning of a new week. Someone desired this day but could not, God. Uh, someone desired to see another day to be able to worship, praise, and to walk and to move even in the midst of all of this uh, pandemic. Uh, but God, you called them home. So we're grateful today that we still have life, living, and breath in our lungs today, knowing that that our days are numbered, knowing that is an appointment that we have to meet with this almighty God. We ask that you now would search our hearts, search our minds, uh, cleanse us, oh God, from every thought or every evil intent uh, that may have infiltrated into our hearts and minds. We repent right now, God, because we see that all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who we must give an account. So we just ask right now for cleansing, cleansing of this nation, cleansing of our mind, cleansing of our spirits that we will be able to hear, see, hallelujah, and be able to understand your next move or this next change that you're getting ready to produce here in this earth. And we come against every satanic and every demonic influence in the name of Jesus that may have attacked us in our minds, attacked us in our physical bodies, attacked us in our sleep, attacked us even in our locations. We come against it now and I command Satan in the name of Jesus Christ to loose this nation, to loose every person who has come under the umbrella of God's divine protection. Those of them who have struggled for years to come underneath, underneath of the spirit of bondage in the name of Jesus. And I break every chain, every chain in the spirit, every shackle, everything that would have controlled us to lean not to our own understanding, but to lean to our own understanding and to try to figure things out the way we should be and the way things should be. But we ask for the mind of Christ tonight. We ask for the mind to understand the purpose, the will, the strategy, the plan and the purpose that God has for all of our lives. God, we praise you this night. We thank you tonight because we know that you're doing a great work. We know, God, that you're still on the throne. We know that you're still in control of what's happening today, despite of what has entered into our ears and our minds that have uh, caused negativity, that has caused fear, anxiety. We ask God, remove these things out of our life in the name of Jesus. Take out the anxiety. Take out the fear. Take out the distraction. Take out the worry out of our lives and out of our hearts, God, that we will see clearly the vision and the purpose and the plan that you have for our lives today. God, we bless you tonight for life, health, and strength. We thank you today, God, that we can still love you. We can still serve you. We still have a mind focused on you, regardless of what's happening all around us. We still have an attentive spirit. We still have a longing in our soul to be faithful to you, God. God, if you should so come back in this hour, God, redeem us, count us faithful, wash us and cleanse us with the blood and allow us to enter into that paradise, that land flowing with milk and honey, that you would cause us worthy to walk down those streets of gold that you prepared for us, God. Oh, Lord, if you should come back in the midnight hour, Lord, while we're asleep, oh, Lord, we pray that we would be counted worthy to return home, to be with you in glory to see our ancestors, to see our loved ones, those whom you called before us, those who are waiting for us at that moment, at that hour, to receive us into heaven's glorious kingdom. God, we count it done. We believe by faith, Lord. Strengthen our faith. Encourage us, Lord, where we've been torn down. Strengthen our weaknesses in this very hour and give us a motivation, not for man, not from the pulpit, but by thy eternal and glorious spirit, Fill our lives today and make us be useful for the master's will. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we count it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining this broadcast. Listen, you got to be with me on the next Sunday. I'm going to talk to you again. The doctrine of Christ and what we need to follow, who we need to listen to, and how we need to prepare uh, for the coming new kingdom that's going to be issued to the earth. I got many things to say. I need to end this broadcast. You God bless you. Thank you for joining this broadcast. You until we meet again, may heaven smile upon you and may heaven give you his peace.